over the floor to, uh, to Grayson and to, and to John. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charles, for having us. We're looking forward to the presentation. Um, and and uh, yeah, I just appreciate all the work that you've put into making this happen. So as Charles uh, mentioned, the name of our company is DISA, which is short for disassociation. And what we do is disassociate composite materials into their discrete subfractions. So going forward regarding our team, Uh, my background is in the uh, energy industry and, and federal state politics in the United States. I've got a JD MBA in energy management from the University of Wyoming, an undergraduate and graduate degrees from Georgetown University. Uh, and I met John Lee um, while we were in our MBA program together. And we started this in January 2018. We'll kind of get into more details about uh, the intellectual property that, that we've put together as well as the, the scale up of our technology. But John, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is John Lee. I was born and raised in Wyoming, went to the University of Wyoming for my undergrad as well as my MBA in energy management, like Grayson said, where we actually met. I'm a PhD candidate in mining engineering and I've worked for startups in the past and then kind of approached this idea with Grayson in January 2018 and have been working on DISA since. So in addition to the two of us on our management team, uh, their technical advisor, Dr. Miskovich, uh, she's also a professor at the University of British Columbia and a renowned expert in minerals processing. Uh, and then we also have Mark LeBeer who also sits on our board. Uh, he was head of uh, R&D for um, uh, Newmont Mining for several decades and, uh, and has been great in facilitating our efforts. And then we've got uh, Tara Getty who serves as our general counsel and then Dr. Ben Cook who um, helps us with our finances. In addition, uh, we're, we're still a startup company but we've got two process engineers on the team an operations coordinator, a lab tech. And then as we'll get into further detail in the presentation, we leverage the resources of three different R&D centers to further facilitate the commercialization of our technology. Okay, so kind of what, what is the technology? We call it HIPSA, which stands for high pressure slurry ablation. And really what we're doing here is we're taking material, mixing it with water to form a slurry and then creating a particle to particle collision, which you can see in the image on the left. So really, if you can imagine all these little soil particles in a, in a wet form, we're just um, pumping those through some high pressure pumps, causing that particle to particle collision where the liberation will occur. It's a mechanical process. And really we kind of relies on that agglomerate attrition. So kind of the idea is once the material has now been liberated, then it allows for easier, easier physical separation downstream and it is a modular unit. So kind of that unit on the right is what we call gen alpha. And really that's where we can mobily deploy this unit to various sites based off if it's a reclamation effort or a mining effort. And really the big value add there is um, significant less waste reduction, cost savings. It's very, very fast processing times. And like I mentioned, it's very rapid deployment. So kind of the idea of the liberation, I think this image shows it nicely. So one of our main target markets is abandoned uranium mine cleanup as well as uranium mining opportunities. And really what we see here in the uh, kind of Southwest region in the Eurovan mineral belt is on the left, you have kind of this pre-material that we find on an abandoned uranium mine site. And really it's a underlying sand grain in that sandstone hosted formation. And it has a mineral patina coating, which contains the uranium and other heavy metals. At DISA, what we do is we'll take this material, mix it with that water, like I mentioned, to form that slurry and process it through some high pressure pumps causing that particle to particle collision. And then on the right side, you can see now we have a clean sand grain left intact and that's for the rec reclamation efforts. We'll leave this clean sand grain on site and extract just the hazardous waste. So in this instance, we can concentrate 90% of the uranium into just 10% of the mass. So you have those fast processing times and cost savings because now you can extract just the target material. So looking at our different R&D partnerships, uh, we've done a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work with the University of British Columbia. Um, through our work, we're, we're working um, with Imperial Oil through an IOC grant that the University of British Columbia received to continue R&D uh, for our technology as applied to oil sands. We're also working with a major potash producer. And then um, through the MyTax program, uh, we're, we're looking to have several PhD students uh, conduct different benchmarking analysis setting up different experimental designs so we can really better understand that mechanism of breakage, those energy size relationships with the different material properties, uh, as well as looking at valorizing different mine waste uh, in applying our unit. So that's our unit down there in, in the bottom left that sits at UBC's lab. Uh, we also work uh, in Colorado with Forte Dynamics, a private company 
uh, and they, they further help us with uh, lab testing and, and unit optimization and then scale up. Uh, the primary materials we're looking at right now with Forte Dynamics consists of uranium, vanadium, hydrocarbon remediation, and phosphate. And then with Montana Tech, uh, that's again uh, one of our um, lab units there at, at Montana Tech's lab. They're looking right now primarily at the liberation of different coal tailings and talcor, and then secondary materials that we'll be looking at in the future uh, consists of garnet and different gold tailings. As far as our units and, and where we're at to date, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've got those three different lab scale units that are at our different R&D partners facilities. Uh, the, the largest pilot we've done so far is that Gen Alpha unit, uh, which can process approximately 20 tons per hour. Uh, we took that to a site uh, two summers ago to an iron mine in, in order to see how everything works in that continuous circuit um, at that larger scale with significantly larger volumes than what we've handled in the lab. Um, based off of that process um, and that experience, uh, we worked with Mill Creek Engineering uh, to come up with a uh, unit, Gen Bravo here, uh, which is basically a repurposed frack tank using our different pumps uh, that can process 40 tons per hour in continuous circuit and putting together that full mass balance and process flow diagram. And, and this particular um, design that we did with Mill Creek is tailored towards abandoned uranium mine reclamation, specifically on the Navajo Nation with those sandstone hosted rock formations. Looking at our target markets, um, you know, really, really what we say we're, uh, we like to process those soft to medium type hardness ores, uh, especially when you've got a, a harder mineral and a softer mineral. As John showed in that uh, prior example with that um, uranium mineral patina coating, we're able to really knock that off uh, those, those interlying sand grains quite effectively. Uh, although our technology does serve as a um, comminution uh, technology as well. But so far, um, you know, we've, we've had uh, really uh, significant and positive results in uranium vanadium. Uh, this is our highest technology readiness level so far. And really we're just working on getting that scale by that unit to fully bridge that commercialization gap and get to that, that full process in those specific sectors. And, and that includes the abandoned uranium mine reclamation as well. And then for the other um, target markets here, we're continuing to pursue um, R&D and, and, and to gather um, more data so that we can move from that lab scale unit to that commercial unit. So kind of going back to the AUM abandoned uranium mine, um, case study where I had those two SEM images. This kind of shows the, the size distribution pre and post HIPSA process. So on the left, this would be at a typical abandoned uranium mine. And this is kind of the mass distribution and uranium distribution. And I know this is in US mesh size, but really on the left, that plus 60 is our coarsest fraction. And then minus 325, it would be our finest fraction, which is roughly 44 microns. What we're trying to show here though, is right now to clean up a site, you have to haul 100% of the material offsite just because that mass and uranium are kind of co-located in each size fraction. Post-process though, now you can see we have over 90% of the uranium into roughly just 10% of the mass. So this is where the large economic savings come. If we can, if we can concentrate this, we're reducing transportation by 90%, reducing that uh, post-disposal or processing by roughly 90%. And we have a concentrated product that we can take off site, leaving a clean fraction on site. Another uh, reclamation effort that we're looking into is both high, um, hydrocarbons, which would be oil spills and drill cuttings. So this uh, site on the left was a small oil spill in Wyoming, and we were able to collect material from this and actually reduce it to a level that is, meets the regulations and standards of Wyoming. And then on the right, we have drill cuttings. And uh, the idea here is rather than disposing of these drill cuttings at a land farm, if we could clean them up on site and lower the, the total extractable hydrocarbon level to a, a standard that meets regulation we could put back on site. And so kind of those results, like I said, so the, the dirty material was on top, that's pre-process. It was roughly 18,800 parts per million. And then post a post-process, we got it down to 3,800 parts per million. In Wyoming, anything below 6,500 parts per million was clean enough to put back on site. But really our target is 1,000 ppm. So we're doing continued R&D on this to get it to where we can meet standards of any state or any area. This, uh, this image just shows what our footprint would be for an oil spill application. So this summer, uh, we did significant testing and a pilot with total oil field services. 
uh, where we had our lab scale unit linked up with their centrifuge, uh, where as John had described in the previous slides, we're reducing those total extractable hydrocarbons and then running that slurry through that centrifuge to uh, separate the solids from the water. And so just further refining that process, um, you know, really the, where our um, intellectual property resides is, is in that liberation and, and using our high pressure slurry pumps. But, uh, you know, depending on the certain type of material that we're going after, there's always associated equipment that's needed. Uh, I saw, you know, one of the uh, questions asked, what technology do we use for separation processes? And that really depends on the type of material. In the case of uranium, uh, because we're finding that the uranium's um, uh, easily classified in those smaller uh, microns or mesh size fractions, we're using hydrocyclones or, or screens for that. Um, but, but each different target application has a different um, separation process associated with it. And that's where we do have a lot of work um, putting together those, those particular circuits. So one of our efforts up at University of British Columbia is kind of benchmarking this ex against um, existing communication technologies. And so to date, with the, the time we've had in the lab, we've kind of benchmarked both AUM, abandoned uranium mine material, and hydrocarbon material. And what we're seeing is it's right around five kilowatt hours per ton. Um, we're finding this to be much more energy efficient than an attrition scrubber or a ball mill. So kind of this is just to show that future research at UBC, we're really trying to prove um, this is a very energy efficient technology that still achieves the recovery that we're looking for in the different materials. And so here's just a few more results. We can kind of go through these quickly. I wanted to just show some more research efforts. So potash is something we've done a, just some beginning research up at UBC and looking forward to doing more. But again, but again here, comparing it to the attrition scrubber, we found in just two minutes of processing time that we had nice comminution, nice particle size shift. And this um, kind of now that now that the lab's reopening, looking forward to doing more research on these uh, materials, as well as iron. This was a site that we tested in Wyoming about a year ago. And really what we found was we had, again, a nice particle size distribution shift. We were liberating all of the um, potassium and feldspar and clay from the FE content. And through some continued research at UBC, we hope to be able to upgrade that FE content for the mine owner. This uh, shows the SEM images nicely for that site. Um, really what we were trying to show here and illustrate is we're fully liberating all of that clay, feldspar, and other materials around the FE. If we can upgrade it to around 45%, the mine owner found this um, economic for his process. And this is research we plan to do in Q2 at UBC. And then finally gold. These were uh, some gold tailings piles. Really the, the main purpose here is to go see if we can reprocess this material and extract the, the valuable materials. And what we're illustrating here is we have that nice liberation. We call it selective liberation because we're not over grinding the fines or uh, blasting apart the target material, but rather just creating that nice um, liberation around boundary lines. And then finally, this was uh, that Sunrise Iron Mine site. This would have been summer of 2019. And this is when we piloted that commercial prototype unit. I spent the summer here. And really this was our first chance to actually scale up the technology to that to that commercial pilot scale, um, realized the inefficiencies, and now we have went back to the drawing board and redesigned for our 40 ton per hour unit. And with that, I uh, just wanted to answer any questions you all have. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, John and Grayson. Okay, so we did touch on some of the questions here, but I think maybe we just restate them to make sure that we, that we get a, a more fulsome answer. Uh, so the first question here is, uh, what magnitude of energy is required for, for this uh, technology to work? So this is our, our, I guess, first chance at really benchmarking it. And that's where we were coming up with five kilowatt hours per ton. What we would like to do, though, is now that we're building that, this is kind of what we call Gen Bravo, that 40 ton per hour unit. Um, the goal is to build this this summer and deploy it to a site this fall. And that's one of the main areas that we plan to, to kind of benchmark. It runs off the 480 volt three phase power, but we, we believe it will be around 50% more energy efficient as compared to other communication or attrition scrubbing technologies. Okay, okay awesome, thank you, John. Uh, next question is I'll ask you two questions at the same time here. Uh, why use water and also does this not attenuate the energy? So right now the water is that transport medium to move those solids so we can create those particle to particle collisions. Uh, typically we run anywhere from, uh, depending on the pump, 40 to 70% by mass solids. And, and so, you know, as we continue to develop the technology and move forward, 
we, we'd love to find a system that doesn't use water, but right now that's the most effective means of, of transporting that material throughout our system um, at, at present. Okay. Awesome. And the next question, I think, Grayson, you touched on it a little bit uh, when you were commenting about the screens. Uh, but the question here is, uh, what technology do, do you use uh, for the separation process? Yes, yeah, exactly. so I, I can touch on that. I apologize. So it, it really depends on its material specific. So this is one instance, the process flow diagram for an abandoned uranium mine. Really, this is this is main process here in the bottom. What we're using though is we're classifying based off size. So either um, cyclones to classify that 270 mesh or actually wet vibratory screens. For gold, we've looked into different gravity um, type separations, but really kind of our R&D process would be get the material, do a material characterization to understand really how are these um, materials and elements held together. And then we will run the samples in the system to understand that particle size shift over time. And then from there, we, we have those partnerships with UBC Forte Dynamics and Montana Tech to really understand what secondary separation technology best pairs with our liberation technology to achieve the concentrations and recoveries we're looking for. Okay, all right, thank you, John. And next question is, uh, could you comment on uh, applicability for scrubbing oxide products of sulfide mineral substrates? You wanna get on, Grayson? You can take that one, John. Okay. Yeah. So my, I guess my best bet, I, I personally have not tested this or looked into it, but um, what we believe we could do is if we, again, could get the material, kind of get that initial sample and understand the material characterization. We have several engineers on the team and then uh, Dr. Miskovic up at UBC, we can work with her to kind of outline what a testing regimen might look like. And then if we can procure just a small amount of samples, several five gallon buckets, we kind of say that we would just like to do some initial campaigns to understand how the material would behave in the system. Okay, thank you for that answer. Next question is, uh, any thoughts on microwaves to weaken particles and reduce energy requirements for liberation? We, we have not looked into that, but that's certainly something that we can talk to our technical team about and further investigate. All right, thank you. Next question is, uh, could you comment on equipment wear and or materials of construction? Yeah, so as far as equipment wear, I, mean, I don't know if I have any photos in this deck, but the, the units evolved over time. So initially we were seeing a lot of wear in the, uh, in the nozzle chamber. So you can see the nozzle chambers here with some different um, pieces that we had in between the nozzles. Since then, we've kind of done a redesign. We have the pumps directly flowing straight into the nozzles before it was a flow where it would discharge and the flow would split as in this design. So the main, main areas of wear were from discharge of the pump, the discharge of the pump to um, the particle collision. So we've kind of redesigned that, worked with engineering teams, and that's where Jen Bravo addressed all the wear concerns that I saw at the Sunrise Iron Mine. And we have not had the chance to build Jen Bravo yet, but through simulations and calculations, we believe it should address the major wear concerns. And at this point, we will just have those, those regular wear items that we change periodically, um, kind of as planned for maintenance. Great. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, next question is, um, we've got 10 minutes to go, guys. Um, next question is, do you have any plans to evaluate regrind for hard base me metal min minerals? Sorry, Charles, can you repeat that one? I didn't. Yeah, question. sorry. Uh, do, you, do you have any plans to evaluate regrind for hard base metal minerals? I guess uh, I would, at the moment, we don't have plans to look at that in the immediate future. We've kind of decided as a startup, our best areas of focus would be at Forte Dynamics, we're looking into uranium, vanadium phosphate and hydrocarbon cleanup. At UBC, we're looking mostly into oil sands and potash. And then with Montana Tech, we're looking at coal tailings and some talcor. It's one of those where if, if we found a partner that had significant interest in looking into a stream like that, we would again, kind of the process is to get that initial material characterization, look at have our technical experts review and see if it potentially has to be a good fit with HIPSA and then do some initial campaigns through UBC or Montana Tech. All right. Thank you for that answer. What is the top size of the feed material? Yes, yeah, so the, the top size is directly correlated to the pump size on the unit. So you can imagine as we scale up, we can pass larger particles. Currently at the moment with the, the Gen Alpha unit design we have, we can pass half inch particles. Um, it's one of those things though, as we scale up, we would like to be able to pass larger ore. But right now we, we typically tell partners we would like to see quarter inch to half inch particles. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, next question is, uh, what about radiometrics for sorting uranium? Any thoughts? 
We, we recently talked with an expert in this field and uh, who, who has spent several decades uh, with ore sorting for uranium. And due to the complexity and the dry nature of that process, uh, we came to the conclusion that our, our system in, in isolation would be more effective from an economic uh, and liberation standpoint than pairing it with or sorting. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, next question is really maybe um, to get some clarity. So with, with, your, with your HPSA, uh, uh, it breaks the particle into the base components, but you still need to approach the separation by relevant unit operations, this question. Yeah, and I, I see that from Mike Samuels here. So that's exactly what we do. We kind of, we get the material and we procure enough samples to run several tests in our lab scale units. And so really that's um, this unit here. And then this one, we just took to Montana Tech. From there, we, the initial study would be residence time in the system. So we like to illustrate, okay, after two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, what does the particle size distribution look like? And we start seeing that initial shift and understand how the coarse fraction kind of separates into those various sizes. From there, we like to um, work with the different labs, UBC, Montana Tech, and Forte, to really understand, okay, based off these, this um, material characterization and these residence times, this would be a perfect candidate for flotation, maybe some other form of gravity separation. And then I guess even classification just based off size, we see that with uranium size seems to be the best and most economic way to classify the material. And then from there, we kind of uh, study the different unit operations and, and pair it with the optimal separation process. Okay. John, do you want to go to the um, that process flow diagram that we have, and you can zoom in, and we can walk through to more clearly illustrate that. This one, Grayson. Yep. Yeah. So this is for uranium or abandoned uranium mine. So on the this answers the top size question. We're really kind of putting that grizzly out there to see if material needs to be crushed. Once it's been crushed for this unit, we have quarter inch particles inserting inserting this uh, initial mix tank. We run a primary cyclone just to classify the fines out immediately. There's no reason to overprocess those fines. As we know, the uranium settles in that minus 270 mesh or 53 mm -hmm. microns. From there, we know that uranium goes through four collision chambers to have the optimal liberation for this site that we were testing. And so kind of after DISA's process, those four boxes, we then classify again with the cyclone and we have our um, product and reject. And this is where, like I said, 90% of the uranium will concentrate into roughly 10% of the mass. And that's what we would remove from the site. And then the remaining 90% of the mass is now clean enough to be left on site. For other industries though, like I said, at the lab scale, we would pair it with different unit operations to find the optimal separation or concentration technology. Awesome. All right, thank you. Next question is from Phil. Is, uh, and I, I'm gonna maybe add another piece to this question is, but the question is how much sample do you need for a test program? And maybe just to add on to that question is what is the time frame? For, for any testing that you need to do. Right, so we, uh, we built a, a smaller unit. It's not illustrated in this, in this slide deck, but it's the unit that will be going to Forte Dynamics. To run just one campaign in that unit, we say we need roughly two five gallon buckets or that's right around hundred pounds of material. With that, we have enough material to actually do that initial material characterization, understand the particle size distribution of the feed material. And then we also have enough material to run one test in the HIPSA unit and kind of understand that effective time on the process and then pair it with different unit operations. In a, in a dream scenario, we would ask a partner to send maybe a 55 gallon drum of material to where we could run several campaigns, but, but really 100 to 200 pounds to kick things off and, and do at least an initial study. And then I guess part two of the question for you, Charles, as far as a time frame, just depending on how quickly we can receive samples, if we assume samples are in hand, I would say to get initial results one to two months to where we can then present that to the partner, um, kind of how it behaved in the system, what liberation we saw, any SEM or MLA imaging, and then kind of what next steps might look like. Okay, okay thank you for that. Um, I'm seeing no more new questions being typed here. I, I, did, I do have a question for you guys. And my question is, can you comment on um, maybe a pricing model or, or, an, uh, or a technology acquisition model that you would like to utilize for this technology? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that question, Charles. Uh, again, because we have so many different um, applications that we can pursue, each of those different markets uh, you know, call for, for a nuanced business model. Ideally, um, you, we, we envision ourselves as assembling this technology, shaking it down, customizing that process flow and circuit for that specific application, and then selling that technology 
uh, to that um, end user to use. And then we would provide consulting support uh, and then we would license out our IP on the technology. But uh, for like uh, oil spill, for example, um, there we'd be looking to, for either that service model where we would show up on site, especially since oil spills, um, you know, most of the ones we've looked at are 100 to 200 tons of material that need to be quickly cleaned up. So we could go there on site, clean it up in a matter of days uh, and then return. Um, or we, you know, are also open to looking for, since we are a startup for those strategic partners uh, that have those, um, you know, larger resources and, and subject matter experts on this, where we could go and help deploy our technology to those sites uh, with those experts. Right now, um, as we're trying to bridge that commercialization gap, uh, we're, we're working to, to move from those, those lab settings uh, to, the, to the field. Uh, so as we move to that field and for those pilots, we would be um, in most scenarios operating the technology, but with the ideal that we would eventually sell that technology to the end user. Awesome. Thank you for thank you for that. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Jane for the, for the questions. Jane, thank you for the awesome questions. Uh, one more question here is: um, in the floor sheet, there, there was an HPG error. This weekend's green boundary stood. But the question is: do you recommend HPG error in your floor sheets? And uh, I apologize, Jane. I don't know if it's this flow sheet. We we have not tested with HPGR unless you're referring to just that initial crushing. But depending on the site, that's where we possibly need to crush the material. Um, as far as the AUM particles, I'm weakening at the, the grain boundaries. Again, we don't want to overgrind or over crush material because if, then it won't be as easy to, to classify based off size. But really, it'll be kind of site dependent on the Navajo Nation where we're looking to clean up the abandoned uranium mine sites. There's 523 different sites and each site has slightly different characteristics. So each site we would actually go do that initial site survey mm -hmm. and kind of customize the variables of the technology to, to best meet that site's needs. Awesome. All right, thank you guys. Um, did you want to maybe um, have some closing remarks? Because we're down to the last minute at this end here. Um, go ahead guys, any closing remarks? No, we, we just like to thank everyone that, that came to learn more about our technology. We're certainly uh, happy to, to continue the conversation with any interested partners. Um, as John mentioned, you know, we, we've got the three different R&D centers. And so we're always looking to test new materials and see how effective our technology can be and what type of energy savings and other environmental benefits we can contribute to, to different processes. So um, I believe our contact information, Charles, has been provided. We can put that out in the chat, but happy to, to continue the conversation and provide more information, um, certainly after this webinar. Awesome, thank you. All right, so just maybe to wrap things up, we will be sending a copy of this recording and a copy of, uh, of the slides as well to everybody that uh, signed up to this webinar. Uh, thank you very, very much, everybody. We are at two o'clock and um, have a, a great day. Thank you for coming to the webinar. Thank you for hosting, you. Charles. You're welcome.